Well, good morning. Welcome to Believers Fellowship, Magnolia Version. <laughs> Stand with us if you would. In Psalms 121, it says, uh, look to the mountains, but my help comes from the Lord. And uh, in Ephesians and Galatians, it says, by grace are you saved through faith. So amazing grace is the sweetest song I know.
Now would you be wider, much wider than so? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonderful power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonderful power in the precious blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonderful power in the precious blood of the Lamb. And God's power is amazing. So you may be seated. Uh, good to see you in the house of the Lord. Uh, Rebecca and I want to thank you for your prayers. Well, we've been kind of out ill, and so we appreciate your prayers, your thoughts, your concerns, and we, uh, it means a lot to us. But uh, we're back and ready to go and uh, just praising the Lord for all God's doing. Uh, we do want to take this time first to welcome our guests that are uh, joining us online. Uh, we're glad that you're either a first-time guest joining us or maybe you're a long-time watcher, and we just uh, appreciate you doing that. We would ask while you're watching to click the comment session to be able to give us a comment there so we know that you're watching and viewing, and also to be able to click the share button there and be able to share with your contacts the message, the worship, and all that uh, God's doing here. We appreciate you doing that as well. Uh, to our first-time guests here at Believers Fellowship, we welcome you here. We're glad that you've come and chosen Believers Fellowship to, to be a part and a guest and a uh, we just means a lot to us, and uh, we hope you're already feeling the spirit of the Lord in this place. As you came in, you should have received uh, one of the uh, welcome cards, the, like the ones up on the screen. If you didn't, there's some in the pockets in the chairs right in front of you. If you'll grab one of those and fill that out, we would appreciate it. Also, put any prayer requests you may have on that card that you'd like uh, to be prayed for. And uh, don't worry, we won't be sharing your information. We just want to be able to thank you and praise the Lord for your visit and be able to give you some big upcoming events, maybe to your email. So if you could do that, we'd appreciate it. Hang on to that card because at the end of the service, we have a gift that we'd like to give our very special first-time guests. So just hang on to that. We'll remind you at the end of the service. But uh, right now, we would like to welcome our first-time guest. And so if you're a member or a regular attender, find somebody maybe you don't know that well. Let's welcome our guests to the service and be able to welcome them. If you make your way back to your chairs, we're going to have a time of prayer. And so uh, we're also going to be praying for our school. And so uh, uh, if you'll just, you can go ahead and remain seated. We're going to be praying that we won't have, be having the scripture reading. We'll, I'll be doing that in the message. Uh, but our schools uh, begin this week as well. Teachers, and I know they've been already coming, but the kids start this week, Magnolia. And so we want to also, when we pray for our service, be praying for uh, those teachers and those children as they, administrators as they start uh, school this week. So let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come before you today and 
God, we just thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy and your goodness to us. Father, we do pray for our school system, Lord, this week, Lord, as they start school. We pray for the students, the teachers, administrators, and all the employees, Lord, that make up the school district, Lord, that do each one do such a crucial job in educating our children, no matter what task it is that they've been assigned to, Lord, each one's important. We just pray for them, for their safety, their provision, their strength, their health, uh, their families, uh, God, their tasks that they do, Lord, you'd give them wisdom, discernment, direction, Lord. And for the children, Lord, as they learn, Lord, just protect them and minister to them, Lord. God, use this time in their life, Lord, to grow them closer to you, even as they grow in wisdom and discernment. Father, we pray for our service today as we meet together, Lord, right now. We just pray our hearts would be open, God, that we would receive what you would want us to, Lord, that our, our hearts would be like a blank check right now, Lord, to say, Lord, whatever you fill in is good with me. Father, we thank you for your love and your provision. Lord, you're so good to us. Lord, even in the midst of difficulty, health challenges, financial situations, all the negative that can flood our life. Lord, we look around in big and little ways, and there you are, God, to walk us through. And Father, we thank you for that. But Lord, we thank you most of all for your son, Jesus Christ, and his death on the cross that made our salvation possible and showed us the love that you have for us. So Father, may you be glorified God, may hearts be turned to you. May souls be surrendered to you even for the first time or drawn back to you. And may you do a work in our midst that only you can get the credit and the honor for. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand up as we continue to worship the Lord.
praise the Lord for that fountain. Amen. Thank our music team for always being so faithful to lead us in worship. We're so grateful to them. And, uh, well, I'll tell you what, I was telling Rebecca the other day, I have been preaching 26 years and I don't, told her, I don't think I've had more of an attack in bringing or writing or delivering or coming up here to preach a message than this one. I don't know what it is. I know every message Satan hates, but man, this one has just took a beating on me. And I felt like it was all over after two weeks of just seemed like it's been a constant attack. And I would say, well, at least it's all over. I'm heading to church and a lizard jumps on my head on the way to the garage. <laughs> I'm like, get off. It's like, is it going to stop? Can I finally preach this message? I mean, my goodness, is this the last of the attack? You know, it was just, I mean, constantly. And so, uh, but I'm here and we're here. And we're ready to preach on the church, the body of Christ. And we won't be going over all these verses, 12 through 26, but we'll cover just a few. And the next time I have the opportunity to preach, we'll continue on. Each, each of these can continue to add to them. They don't have to be back to back as we preach Sunday to Sunday, but we want to get as far as we can. And so uh, here uh, is the passage that we'll be reading uh, for even as the body is one and yet has many members, all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we've all been baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, or we are all made to drink of one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. And we won't get that far. We'll probably just uh, get the first verse but because uh, there's so much meat there that we want to be able to not overlook any part of the Word of God and miss something. So first of all, when we talk about the church, you know, a lot of people think of the church, they think of this building. You know, if you go home today and you forgot your coat, what are you going to say? I left my coat at church. In other words, it's up here at this building, but we are the church we're meeting in this building right now, but once we vacate it, this isn't really the church anymore. The church is left because we are the church. The people make the church. When the building flooded uh, one time at spring and we met across in the parking lot and uh, my truck was the podium and, I mean, was the stage. The back of my truck was the stage and the podium was up on the truck and we were in the parking lot. That was where church was that day, was out in that parking lot. So we are, the church is where the people are because we make up the church. And so it's so important to see. Now the word church is a, a Greek word, ekklesia, which means the called out ones. Uh, it's really used in that terminology in the Greek had to do which, with any gathering of people was an ekklesia, a gathering, a group, people that come together. But we're actually a special group. We're actually a group gathered together of the called out ones and so that's us. We're, we're the church. Matter of fact, some churches put on their marquee, the church meets here, which is real specific. In other words, it's not here, but it meets here because when it doesn't meet here, it's not here. And so they really are specific in their... You know, now, a lot of people know that the church is in one sense universal, meaning all believers everywhere are the church. Okay, that's the body of Christ. So we, we don't exclude it from being universal uh, and everywhere, meaning all the people make up the church. But we're going to look at, even though it's everywhere, it meets in locations, in local locations. And so we need to differenti differentiate between that because a lot of people you talk to nowadays just say, well, you, are you a member of a church? No, I'm just part of the universal church. So you don't go to anywhere, no, no, I'm just part of the universal church, which in one sense, there is a universal church, meaning everybody, but, but to be obedient, you need to be part of a local church. And uh, so a guy came up to the church one time, and he saw that the pastor was there at the church, so he knocked on the church door, and the pastor came to the door and said, hey, can I help you? And the guy said, I need some benevolence help. I'm going to need a couple of hundred dollars to help me, I'm about to be evicted and I need some help and so the guy listened to him whatever and uh, listened to his situation and then he said well where do you go to church and he said I don't go to church he said well are you saved and he went over the plan of salvation no he said oh I know the Lord I got saved and he told him how he got saved he said but I'm not part of a church 
I'm just part of the universal invisible church, which he had heard about. All the church is just universal. So he just said, I'm part of that individual universal church, but I don't go to a particular church location. Just count me in as the universal church. So yeah, I listened to his situation, the pastor did. So uh, he asked the pastor, well, am I going to be able to get some help? And so the pastor said, sure you are. So the pastor reaches in his pocket as if to grab an, his wallet, but he brings out not his wallet. There's just nothing in his hand, but it looks like he's holding a wallet. And he opens this thing that looks like a wallet, but there's nothing in his hand. And he pulls out what looks like he's pulling out money, but there's no money because there's no wallet in his hand. And he pulls out this emptiness and starts looking like he's counting out money out of this invisible wallet and invisible money, he's counting it out. And so he hands the guy this nothing in his hand and says, here, here's your help. And the guy goes, what is this? He goes, that's your invisible universal money from the invisible universal church. Spend it and be well. You see, people don't accept that, but they accept this mentality like I don't need to be part of a local congregation. It's just the universal church, and that's not what it is. You know, it's like if you wanted to get hired uh, to carry on uh, the mission at Whataburger, well, you don't go to their headquarters, which is in San Antonio, which operates all their states and all their locations at once. I mean, that's the headquarters. And so that's the universal Whataburger, so to speak. Well, if you're going to get hired on and be part of their mission, which is to make hamburgers, you need to go to the local assembly of Whataburger so that you can get hired on so that you can serve, right? Because you're not going to be serving at the universal one. You're going to serve at the local one because that's where they make the hamburgers for us to buy. And so you get hired on there. You serve there. And that's also where you get your benefits, your paycheck, your probably discount on food and free drinks or whatever else benefits they give you, they give you at the local establishment. So there's Whataburger Universal and there's Whataburger at, Whataburger, Whataburger at the local level is where they carry out the mission endeavor of the company. Are you gathering what the church is? Yes, it's everybody, but it operates locally in the local assemblies like ours and others that gather to preach the Word of God, it gathers locally for people to be able to minister, worship, serve one another, love one another, minister to one another, get benefits themselves, but also minister to other people as well. Because when you work for Waterburger, you're serving, but also you're being blessed as well. It also is seen evident in the seven churches, Paul uh, wrote to those churches. Uh, to Romans, he wrote to the beloved, that's the believers in Rome. And Corinthians, he wrote to the church at Corinth. And Gal Galatians, he wrote to the churches of Galatia. In Ephesians, he wrote to the saints at Ephesus. In Phil the Philippian letter, he wrote to the saints or believers at Philippi. To Colossians, he wrote to the saints and faithful brethren, that's the believers who in Colossae. And Thessalonians, he wrote to the church at Thessalonians. Those were local assemblies. That wasn't the universal church. Yes, those were believers in locations where they met and worshiped and were taught and were discipled and gave and served and did all of those things. If you look at Revelations, which we're going through, we've already went through these chapters, uh, those letters were to the churches the church at Ephesus, the church at Smyrna, the church at Pergamum, the church at Thyatira, the church at Shur church at Sardis, the church at Philadelphia, and the church at Laodicea. Those were churches at locations in cities that met. So yes, there's the universal, everybody is considered the church, all believers, but in practicality, in use, in ministry, in carrying out the mission of the kingdom, it's not done at headquarters, which it is because that's where we report to, but it's done in practicality at the local level, which is here at our church and other churches that are serving the Lord in other areas. And so we see that that's a mentality that many people have is, well, I'm just part of the universal church and they're not part of a local 
assembly. So let's look at a few things about it. First of all, the church is like a body. Uh, it isn't a body. I mean, I'm not, if, uh, it's an analogy. And the analogy is so good that the Bible gives to show really what is a church like. And I love how the Bible gives illustrations. Because if you're like me and you got a book, I'd rather see the picture with the diagram than to read it. Okay? Show me the picture, that'll give me a better picture. Right? We like photographic memories, that's because we like photos. Show me a picture, make it simple for me. Well, the, the Bible is so good and God was so good to give us great illustrations to say, I don't know if I can really capture it, but boy, when you can get an illustration to say, okay, you really want to know what your church is like? What is church like? It's like a body. It's like a body. And he gives that, that verse to us. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, so all the members of the body, though there are many, were one body. So he made us like this with all these different body parts, but he put them all together as one body. Otherwise, if he would have made us with body parts that are loose and can go different directions, can you imagine? We already lose our cell phones. I can't believe I left my, I left my lung back at the house. You know, my thyroid, gosh, I, I know I left it in that bottom drawer. I mean, you think of what all we would lose if they were separate individual parts and weren't attached. Okay, I guess I'm the only one that misses my cell phone sometimes. I mean, your keys, your whatever. Praise the Lord that the God put us as a body, many parts all connected together and all useful because it's connected together. And that's what we're going to be amazed by later, later on. You know, what, what is it in the scripture that says is fearfully and wonderfully made? The body. Our bodies are fearfully and wonderfully made. I mean, I, you know, all of God's creations amazes me. You see the rainbows, you see the sky, you see the birds, you see everything in creation just amazes me, but nothing amazes me more than the human body. It's just, how does it breathe? It, it has thinking power, it vision powers, and it's just amazing that we can walk and talk and do things and the, what the body does. Just stop one time and just lay down and think about the body. And of all the illustrations, and a lot of you have heard me say this, and I still believe it, whether you believe it or not, I have a right to my opinion. I don't believe it was like, oh, there's the body. And one day God said, I think I'll use that for an illustration. I believe God started by making the body to be the illustration of the church. That's how important it was. And this body's going to be gone anyway, so who cares about it later? But it's so important spiritually to say, look, if you didn't get it, I created that body just so you could see how the church is. Not for any other reason, maybe, than just to understand the church. I believe that. I believe that's how important it was that he created us like this just to be the illustration. The side note is we're able to carry on and live and drink and work and all that other stuff. That's just a side note of how important it is for us to grasp this. The word body occurs 16 times in 27 verses of this chapter. 16 times, body, 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 body. I mean, if we leave this message or even read that deal and say, I still don't get it. Like, I'm trying to tell you, the body, just think about it. It'll teach it almost itself if you begin to think, I don't know how important it is or how it operates. It's such a wonderful uh, organism that, that God has done. And then second, the church is like an extremely important body. Extremely important. And these are the last four words we're going to have time to, to, to go over because once I read this, it just changed everything about my even view of the church. I mean, not that I didn't know about the church, but God just did a work when I began to study just those four words. So also is Christ. And I hope you leave the thinking, man, those are going to be one of my four favorite words too. So also is Christ. Now what we're going to be talking about is 
first of all, how unimportant the church has become in our society. And what I'm talking about has nothing really much to do with COVID. I know COVID took its little toll, but I'm not, this began to happen long, long, long before COVID, okay? So don't say, well, yeah, I know some things happen in the church and church attendance and church membership because of COVID. I understand that too. But what I'm talking about occurred long before COVID ever, even before the word ever came up, okay? So it's not about that. It's about something going on long before that that's been going on through church history uh, with various things and situations. And I know some people, as far as being faithful to church, medical situations, sometimes work situations, I know there's some, some, some factors, and we're not incorporating it, that because some people have some factors that just make it impossible. Maybe they're bedridden. Maybe they're, they can't. Maybe they have an illness. They have to stay away sometime. They're, those are exceptions, and, and so we're not looking at those kind of exceptions. We're looking at pretty much the rule of what, how important this body is. So let's look at kind of what's been happening that makes it seem like this body, which we'll go back to see what does that mean, so also is Christ. Let's look at what, how the church has become really more unimportant. Millennials, who in 2022 would be 26 to 41 years old, make up about one-fourth of our population. That's 72 million people. The percentage of millennials in America who describe themselves as religious unaffiliation, they don't have anything to do with church, it's gone from 2008 at 31.9, now up to 42, and who knows what it is now in 2022. It's probably continuing to, to grow and grow and grow that just said, hey, we don't affiliate with any kind of religious organization. The Gallup poll showing church membership in America. In 37, it was 73% of Americans showed themselves as members of a church. 80, 70%. 2,000, 65%. 2010, 59%. 2018, 50%. 2020, 47%. Let me go back. And really, 20, we don't have, I don't have those numbers up to 2022, but you can see the direction it's going. And it's, I believe, going to continue unless something happens, revival in this nation, of it's just going to continue to drop. And that's below 50%. And falling. Lifeway research showed that there were more Protestant churches that closed in 2019 than opened. That was before COVID or anything else. More closing than opening. So we can see that if the body of Christ is so, oh, extremely important, then why are we seeing this? We ought to be seeing the other direction. To say, man, it's, it's important, it's, it's so needed, it's so wanted. We, we just need to be part of our local fellowship. Anybody remember 9-11, September 11th, 2001? I think that happened, if I'm not mistaken, on a Tuesday. Anybody y'all remember being in church that following Sunday after 9-11? Man, that was Easter Sunday almost. Man, we just packed. And other churches we talked to, man, they, were, they had a lot of people. It was just a big, big, big attendance Sunday on 9-11 post-Sunday. But guess what happened, at least in our fellowship, and I believe almost all of them, what happened the following Sunday? Back to normal. It was kind of like, oh my goodness, what's happened to the world? Is this going to be what happening every day? We're getting bombed, we're getting taken over. I mean, what's going on? People might have actually been thinking this. We need God. We need God. Really. You need God all the time. <laughs> it isn't this 9-11. We need God all the time for every day of every moment. But it got back. It only took one Sunday for things to get, I guess things are back. I, I got it. I got it now, God. Don't look like we're going to be taking over all the, every week. And so back we went. We can see how things have progressed downhill. You know, there was a man that taught 13-year-old boys Sunday school for 50 years straight in the same Baptist church. I don't think you caught that. A man taught Sunday school 
to 13-year-old boys for 50 years straight in the same church. Dedicated himself to being at church to teach those boys every Sunday for 50 years. I'm not saying he didn't miss a Sunday or couldn't be out something. I'm, not, I'm just saying that was his commitment for that long. A lot of people, if I told that to them, they'd say, yeah, but Pastor Tim, I, I understand that guy. I mean, you, he doesn't have the job and responsibilities and all the things to take care of like I do. I mean, I got a lot going on, a lot of responsibility, a lot of work responsibility, a lot of, a lot of things that would, he probably didn't, wouldn't even know what I go through to be able to do what I do for my work. Really. Well, his company has 1,800 stores across America, across 40 states. His company earns $5 billion a year. His company has $40,000 I mean, 40,000 employees. He's worth $4.2 billion. His name is Truett Cathy, and he's the founder and owner of Chick-fil-A. Do you have more than 40,000 employees? I mean, we just need a little hand in. Uh, any more than 40,000 that you're responsible for? 1,800 stores. <laughs> How could a man find time with running a corporation, and it really wasn't a corporation because he decided, I'm not going to become a corporation because if I do, I'll have stockholders, and stockholders will say, why are you closed on the big day of Sunday? That's where you make all your money, and we're stockholders, and so that's where you make your money. And he, couldn't, he knew he couldn't convince us, a board deal. What do you tell them? Oh, yeah, no, you got to say, you're right. I'd make a lot more money and our stockholders would make a lot more money. But I want people to do what I do. Have time to go worship God and serve Him. That's what I do for these 13-year-old boys. It was almost like Truett Cathy saying, I minister to 13-year-old boys and I do a little company on the side. That little Chick-fil-A thing just a thing. My thing is those 13-year-old boys. That's what I live for. That's what my calling is. And I'll run that little company on the side. That's just a little sad thing. That's a man that saw the importance of saying, I need to do that. You know, there's another man that, you know what? He, he gave his pastor a call, and I'm not saying you need to do this, or, or a letter every time he missed church to tell him that he wasn't going to be there and why he wasn't going to be there. Okay? I'm not saying you have, to, you have to email me or call me or whatever, but I'm just saying that's what he did. And I know if I told that to most people, they'd say, well, I don't have that kind of time, and I've got a lot of responsibilities, and I've got a lot of stuff to do. My goodness, who does that? Who has that kind of time? Well, the guy that did that was the President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. Do you think you got more going on than the running the entire nation as President of the United States? But he, had to, he made sure he called his pastor. Made sure he wrote a letter. Hey, I, I'm not going to be able to make it this Sunday. Why? Because he saw the importance of the fellowship. I was reading an article by Kerry Neowolf. He wrote an article about 10 reasons why he thought Christians or people were attending church less often. And I was amazed. The only reason I'm bringing this because I didn't think about the very first one he mentioned. You know what it was? Affluence. Not rich, but we're making more money than we used to. And you know what he said? This was his first quote. Money gives people options. There used to be a times like, can't go anywhere else. Can't afford to go anywhere else. I'll go to the house of the Lord. Now that's not a good reason to come to church. Don't get me wrong. But now money, I got options. God's blessed me with options. I remember visiting a house one time. And the people hadn't been at church. And I mean, they used to be faithful and they weren't at church. So man, I went to go visit them and there was like, Oh, Pastor Tim, the Lord blessed us with this house and because He blessed us with this house, it needs a lot of work and we want to bless what God blessed us with and take good care of it and so that's what we've been doing on Sundays. You mean you've taken the blessings of God and used it to not be in the house of the God? That's what they did and they said that's what we did. Don't take affluence. I was thinking, my goodness, we have more options now that we have money. Never thought about that reason. Now, here's a couple of things. We won't be able to get into very many of these, but I think I can cover two. 
Reasons why the church is so important so we can look at that one verse we looked at. Why is it so important? First of all, the church is so important that Christ refers to himself as the church. So also is Christ. So also is Christ. I love what John MacArthur comments on this one, four, four words. He says, Paul is so intent on driving home the point of oneness in the church that he refers to Christ as the church. Did you catch that? He wants to drive the point home so much that he refers to Christ as the church. So also is Christ. Wow, what a great way to look at his holy word. Colossians 1.18, he is also the head of the body, the church. He's the head. We're the body. How many of y'all's heads are not connected to your bodies? And sometimes we feel like they're not in certain things. It's like, man, what was I thinking? You know, nobody in here is disconnected with their head. That's all one. He's the head and we're the body, so we are one. We're one with Him. Wow, what an amazement. Listen to these two verses. Acts 8, many of you know this. What was Saul doing before he came Paul? He was ravaging the church, entering house to house, dragging off men and women, Christians, those are, and putting them in prison. Boy, he thought he was doing the work of the Lord. Remember before he got saved, he was like, you know this word ravaging is only used one time in the New Testament? This verse right here. It means to destroy. It means to tear up. It was like savages, like wild animals that would go and tear up a, kill an animal. And remember how they just shred it up and eat it all up? Just ravage it. Paul was doing that to the church, destroying it, attacking it, persecuting it, just going after it all with all force. He hated the church. Thought he was doing God's will. So we know this passage. Now look at this passage a chapter later. And he, that Saul, fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now I've got a theological issue here. Which one of these passages are right? Is it, was he persecuting the church? 8-3? Or was he persecuting Jesus? 9-4? I've got a little problem here in my theology. I've got to figure this out. Which one of these are right? Was he persecuting the church or was he persecuting Jesus? One and the same. <laughs> That's what we just said in that other passage. Jesus refers to himself as the church. He was saying, you're persecuting me. <laughs> There's no d wrong in Scripture. This isn't an error theologically. This is Christ pointing out me and the church. People you talk to, I love Jesus. Where are you going to try? No, their church. No, church. Who needs church? I mean, who needs church? Christ refers to him as the church. That's what he told Paul, who was Saul then. You're persecuting me because that's me. That's my body. I'm the head of that. Yes, universally, but it meets locally. It's important to him. It's important to him to be knowing that. And that's why we, if we love him, we love his body, which is all of the believers. And where do we love the believers? It's in the church. That's where we see them and meet them and minister to them and help them and teach them and minister our gifts to them. And whatever we do, we do it in the church because he loves the church. And we love what he loves. Now, I know you've heard us say, well, Pastor Tim, we heard y'all pastors talking about well, you could grow up in the church and still be lost. It's like saying, if you grow up in a garage, that doesn't make you a car. And you can grow up in the church, and that doesn't make you a Christian. You're right. We understand that. There's lost and saved people in the church. But saved people will love the church. Because saved people love Jesus, and Jesus loves the church, and even refers to himself as the church. How important is that? You know, how can you say you love the head, which is Jesus, and from the neck down is us, the body? 
You know, I've been to a lot of weddings. I've done to a lot of weddings. And you know, I've never done one that said, Dearly beloved, I'm gathered here together to unite this groom with just his wife's head up and not her body from the neck down. I've never done that. Either he marries all of her or none of her. But that seems like how people want to marry Christ. I'll marry him from the head up, but the church isn't important to him. That's his body from the neck down. Otherwise, you'd be walking around with your spouse with just their head right here. This is, I'd like to introduce my wife. Well, where's the rest of her? Oh, I don't love that part of her. Excuse me? No. Are you silly? Just this part. But that's how silly it is to say, I, I have no love for the church, his body, universally, but meets locally. We have to love what he loves. It's that important. The church is so important that it belongs to God. That word my, remember, upon the rock I will build my church. In Timothy it says the church of God, there's that ownership, it's his. We need to respect what's his. We need to love what's his because he has ownership of it. Obviously it's his body, he should call it mine. The third reason it's important is the church is so important that it's referred to as family. It's referred to as family. I think that shows its importance as well. 1 Timothy 3.50, the household of God, which is the what? The church of the living God, the pillar and the support of truth. What is the church? It's also the household of God. It, we're, we're his household. We're his family. We're his family. Not only his body, but the body is so important that we're his family to call us his household. We belong to his family. That's amazing. First Peter referred to it as the household of God. Ephesians talking about we're no longer strangers and aliens. Man, we're not, we're not just fellow citizens of the saints, but we're of God's household. We're no longer strangers. We're part of the family. You know, you can have a stranger in your house at your door. You may not let them in. You can have somebody that you're kind of acquainted with, you kind of let them in a little bit. But boy, family, they come in, they can lay on the couch, they can get a drink out of the refrigerator. Woo! They're at home. You know, it's like, you know how you say make yourself at home? They make their self at home. Why? Because they're family. They're part of the household. See, we're no longer strangers and aliens. We're so important, the church, that we're part of God's family. God's family. You know how important your family is. Just think how important God thinks of us to say, you're my family. That's how important that group fellowship is to the Lord and how much that means to him to call us that, refer to us as that. Because we're, we're, we know that. Listen to what Augustine once said. Augustine said, he cannot have God for his father who refuses to have the church as his mother. I thought that's pretty good. In other words, I want God to be my father. Well, what about the church? Eh, who needs church? Well, that needs to be like my mother. You know, that's part of me too. I can't dis differentiate the church, how important it is to me. I usually don't ask for a show of hands or anything, but I thought this would be important. If you don't want to raise your hand, you don't know. How many people in here, when you were born, I know you don't remember that day, but on the day of your birth, there was no family ready to take you home. Whether you're born at home or at a hospital or in a car, I won't say a buckboard or wagon because I don't know if anybody be that, but wherever you were born, when you were born, listen, there was no family to take you home. Now, I mean, I'm, you may have been adopted, but that adopted family was there to take you home to the adopted family. Or you, a foster family was ready to take you home to be part of their family. Or your biological family was ready to take you home. How many people in, you, in here were born, on the day you were born, there was no family for you to go home to? In other words, you were just there and the, the government had to come in and say, well, let's just take him and let's put him here until, or her, until... We can find somebody. Anybody? 100% of you in this room 
had a family to go home to when you were born. Listen, when you're born again, you're born again into a family. Okay, four people got that. I'd say that one again. When you were born physically, you were born into a family. And when you were born, if, you're, if you are born again, you were born again into a family. Oh, I'm Lone Ranger. Don't need nobody but me. Me and Jesus is all we need. Where do you get that part of the scripture? I know you need Jesus. Don't get me wrong. You need the Holy Spirit. You need all of that. But you need your family. You need your connection because that's how the Lord ministers to His family is through the gifts and the callings of the church. We minister to one to another. And so when you're born, you're born in a family. When you're born again, you're born into a family. There's no, I'm out here on my own. Now, what would have happened to you if you would have been born and nobody got you in the, fa- in the, in the hospital or whoever said, okay, we're putting this little baby right outside the door and we're going to tell the security officer when he locks it up, just make sure you got the blanket on him and he's good to go. Put that one bottle in his mouth and maybe that'll help. Would you have made it without a family? No, you can't make it on your own. You're not physically able when you're physically born. And when you're spiritually born, we need each other. Oh, you may think, oh, I know my Bible. Oh, I know my Bible. I don't need nobody but me. That doesn't last long till God puts you in a position where you are going to need somebody. And I hope that doesn't come, but that should be coming every day to say, God, I need you. And many things that I get, I get from your body through people that you gift in the church that are ministering to me as I use my gifts to minister to them because we're all part of that family connection. We're connected to a family, and here we're connected to a family. And you know what? What is one of the worst things that can happen in a body is for a body part to get disconnected from the body because its life and its usefulness is in its connection. We're going to get to this in a later, it may be months, but whatever, we get to a later part of how the body works. You see, if you're called illustration wives to be a hand, okay, that's what you're called to do. My hand does real good holding a fork to get food to my mouth. So I like my hand. It does some good things for me. Okay, I appreciate my hand, especially this right one. You know, it holds that fork and... But you know what? It relies on that arm, that elbow, the rest of that arm and that shoulder to get that fork up to my mouth. If it was just a hand, it would just be doing stuff, not much stuff for me and not much stuff for you. It would be kind of useless. It could brag about being a hand and say, what's what I do? Well, what do you do? You don't bring it anywhere. I can pick up something. Well, yeah, but where do you take it? I can pick up a tool, but how do you use it to fix anything? I can pick up a pen, but how do you write with it because you can't move it along the paper? The hand says, oh, I need your arm. I need your shoulder. And brain, tell us how to get it up there, which is Christ. Ooh, that that works good. That works good. All of it working together. And that's how connected we need to be in the church because we... We are what we do, but we're all what we do because we're connected to one another. We are the body of Christ, and we are important. You know, I wrap up with this verse. In my father's house, you've heard us say this over and over at funerals, are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. You know that song we sing about the mansions and that word mansions is really not a good translation. That's from the King James. It's the better translation is dwelling place because when you think of mansion, you think of a separate dwelling place that's all fancy. So you're, you're, you're drawn to fancy and you're drawn to separate. Correct? Because a mansion stands alone. Correct? And a mansion is fancy. But I'm not looking for fancy and I'm not going to be alone I'm going to have a room in his house because I'm part of his family. I won't live alone in my own separate deal. I'll live with y'all a part of our family because it's illustrated here and it's illustrated up there. We better start being connected here because you're going to be connected there. 
There's no one room mansions. There's his house and it has a lot of rooms in it. That's what he was telling us. Even to illustrate again how important the body and us as family are because it's not going to end. For all eternity, we've got the one house, many rooms. We got to just be getting used to the importance of that even now. Enjoying what heaven's going to be even on earth. I don't know all the th stuff that goes on in heaven, but I know the things he's going to have us do on earth because he's lined it out for us. The importance of the body of Christ, being connected with other believers, finding out our place of service, finding out how he'll use us, how other people will use their gifts for, for us. I think that's one thing that's going to be a major disappointment. When we talked to the Lord and said, well, I don't feel like you met this need. Oh, Betty at the church was going to do that because I gave her the gift of encouragement. Remember the gifts that are listed in the Bible? I gave that to her when she got saved because everybody that gets saved gets a gift. And I gave that to her. And when you had been there, she would have given you her gift of encouragement because that's how I give it is through the gifts many times. Yes, individually he does, but he gives it through gifts as well. And m many of the things that we get from the Lord, we get from other people using their gifts to help us. He gives us directly, but he gives it through spiritual gifts, through the body. A lot of what my body gets is from other body parts. You know that? I mean, my hand's getting, if something gets hurt, I got cells in one part that go over here and heal me here, and I got things that hurt here, and this body part goes over here, and it helps here, and the thyroid does. I mean, I can't, I don't know all that stuff scientifically, but I know it all works together to help whatever part needs help. And we're going to look later once we look at different body parts of how important every single body part is. It's all important. I used to not even think the appendix was important, but I read an article now that they're second guessing that. That God didn't make a mistake by putting that in there too. It's all needed. You're needed. I'm needed. We're all needed. Until the day we draw our last breath, we're building God's kingdom but he builds it through the local church, his body, referred to in the scripture even as himself. He's the head, we're the body, and we love his body because we love him. Let's stand to your feet. We're not going to have an actual altar call per se, but I do want to have a time where we reflect on what the scripture has said to us. And so there, right where you are, if you just bow your head and have a moment just between you and the Lord and as the Lord wherever you are in your life the Lord is working I know that he never stops working on us he never stops loving us you may be going through tough times you may be here thinking that God hadn't heard your prayer you may be feeling like you're alone you may be think, thinking like, where is God? And those are legitimate things we all go through. But one thing about it, he's not left us alone. He's given us his Holy Spirit. He's given us his word. He's given us prayer. But praise the Lord, he's given us his church to pray for us, to encourage us, to help us, to give us a meal, to give us a... Of, you know, there's, it goes on and on and on and on and on how that connection to his body is so important. Thank God that he let us be born again into his family. And so where you are right now as you reflect on the importance of his body, let the Lord speak to you in whatever area he's wanting to show you about or your faithfulness to his body, your commitment to his body your love for his body, your service to his body, your finding out places to plug into his body, finding ways to help other body parts that may need help, may need assistance, just being part of the body. Your faithful part, whatever part illustrative-wise you are, it's important. 
There's no body parts you think, well, I think I'll just get rid of this one. No, you'll find out if you do that it was important. Many times that's what the whole transplant is. We may not have one body part, but we end up getting another to replace it. God loves us. He cares for us. He wants to use us. And so that right where you are, just make whatever commitment the Lord is maybe showing to you or renew a commitment or to acknowledge to Him how grateful you are for His body. That He didn't leave us alone to say, okay, you're a baby. You're going to be put illustrative-wise outside the hospital and you got it on your own. Boy, we thank God as we've grown up, all the people that influenced our lives in the churches we were a part of and in the church that we're a part of now. How grateful we are. Maybe your prayer is not only a recommitment, maybe your prayer is a prayer of gratitude on all that God's done through His church. Others may be saying, you know what, I've never been born again. I've never received Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Then today you can make that decision as well and become part of the universal body of Christ. And that is come to know Him as your personal Lord and Savior. Surrender your life to Him. Ask Him to forgive you and save you of your sins even right now. Turn your life over to Him. Believe that He died for you, rose again for you victorious over death for you so that you could have salvation from his perfect sacrifice. So right now you can make that commitment as well. Father, I just pray for each and every person here, Father. God, I pray for people that are struggling in different ways from health issues to financial issues to loss and grief and disappointment and struggles marital issues relationship issues maybe with children or parents Lord whatever the case may be Lord you know that need and I just pray that you'd meet that need Lord whether you choose to meet it supernaturally and directly from you or you choose to use the church the body of Christ to minister one body part to another. So Father, we thank you, Lord, that you haven't left us alone. We thank you for the important body of Christ. Lord, may we never take that for granted. Lord, may you be glorified and honored in our life as we move from this day forward to serve your kingdom for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You may be seated. If you did pray to receive Christ, please let me know if that's decisions you made so I can rejoice with you and give you more information about following the Lord. Well, praise the Lord. We're uh, good to be able to uh, be back and give a, just wrap up a few things as we... uh, Share a few things as we dismiss. First of all, don't forget about Wednesday night. I'll be cranking back with Revelation. Uh, We'll review a little bit of chapter 11 and hit chapter 12. So if you hadn't been out on Wednesday night, come join us as we look through this book that's just so much of a peek into the future. If you want to see the headlines come alive, boy, you can sure see it as we see what we're headed toward in the future And the Bible is clear in the last book of the Bible to the things that will come to pass. And so pick up where we left off. We just finished our Bible studies and we're going back into Revelation, so come join us. Also, we're going to have a baptism next Sunday. And so uh, we already have one lined up. If you haven't been baptized since coming to know the Lord or maybe you have children that's come to know the Lord and hadn't been baptized, let us know and we'll get you lined up. Just call the church office or call me or uh, let any of us know and we'll get you lined up for baptism. Uh, Next Sunday you can join with them. Also, the leadership dinner 
is going to be this year at spring campus. We alternate Magnolia Spring, Magnolia Spring. So one, if you serve in any capacity at the church, uh, you're invited to be part of this. If you're over any ministry, please invite all the people that are in your area ministry that work uh, with you on your teams. Be sure that you let them know about this dinner. It's important. We just do a lot of important things as we talk about the vision and uh, what's coming up for the next year and give out calendars. And, and so if you're serving in any way, make sure you have this down in your calendar and be, be part of that great uh, time together. Uh, also, our marriage conference, make sure that you have that on your calendars. Uh, we'll have one conference at the spring campus, September 23rd through 24th. One conference here from September the 30th through October 1st. If one of those dates don't, doesn't work for you, go to the other campus. We're telling the people at spring as well, if that date doesn't work for you, come on over to Magnolia. And so that'll be a Friday, Saturday. And this will help strengthen your marriage. Uh, title of it is Only Love Matters. And we'll be uh, giving you more information about that. <clears throat> but we'd like you to go ahead and mark it down your calendar so that your calendars work around it. And it won't surprise you. Oh, I got something else going on there. Leave it open for this. We're giving you a little heads up. Also, stay tuned on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, repost things that we post out there so we can get more announcements out that direction instead of necessarily from the pulpit. Also, to our first-time guests, if this year's your very first time, if you'll take the card that you received here and take it out to the lobby, we'll give you a gift that we'd like to present to you and be able to visit with you a little bit. We're so grateful that you're here and part of our service, and we're, we're blessed to have you as our first-time guest. Also, don't forget your tithes and offerings. Be faithful in the giving. Uh, you can mail it, you can give it online, you can, we have offering boxes at the exit doors. Be faithful in your giving. You can see in the newsletter uh, what our shortfall was for the month and be able, to, be able to bless the ministries that we have because we do rely on the people's gifts to be able to carry on the ministries at the church. So be faithful to the Lord. Uh, Jason, did you still want to meet with your parents right afterward? Okay. If you've got youth parents, if you have youth Parents, if you have youth, just meet with Jason over here to my right just for a brief five minutes, and he can go over some things with you. So five minutes, just come over here in this right area, and he'll meet with you then. Anybody that has youth, just for the parents for a few minutes. Amen? Amen. You glad you came? Amen. Amen. God's good, isn't he? All the time. We praise God for that. So I'm going to ask Gary to close us out, and I'll go out and greet any guests we may have. All right. We'll sing a little song here. Uh, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God who goes out to serve. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family.